can sign them. I want to introduce this great panel here. Um, Mike Piper is here. Many of you know Mike. He's a phenomenal resource for so many of us. Mike is the treasurer of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy. He is an invaluable invalu resource to the center. He's a CPA, and he also offers hourly consultations on retirement taxes and investments. Mike, quick question. Are you still accepting new clients for that sort of work? Um, mostly no. Uh, <laughs> my schedule is very limited just because, as most of you know, most of my time is spent writing and doing the work related to that, so my capacity is, is pretty limited. Okay. Um, Mike has a fabulous blog, Oblivious Investor, and he also has written a number of super helpful small books on single topics. So Social Security and tax planning are big areas of expertise for Mike. His latest was called More Than Enough, and it's a, a great resource for people whose retirements are well-funded, but they're thinking bigger picture. Um, Mike has also created a wonderful social security calculator that I think many of you know. It's called Open Social Security. I'm seeing nods out there, which is great. John Luskin is also here. John is an hourly financial planner. John, too, is on our board for the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy. He co-hosts the Bogle Heads on Investing podcast, or at least he was doing it for a good period this summer while Rick was on uh, his sabbatical sojourn in Alaska. Uh, John also hosts the Bogleheads Twitter spaces and is a great resource for many of us in the realm of retirement planning and investment planning. Last but not least, Wade Fow is here. We're very privileged to have Wade here. You all probably saw Wade in the general session just before lunch. Uh, Wade is a professor, researcher. His retirement planning guidebook is the resource, in my opinion. If you're looking to buy a single book that covers every important topic of, under the umbrella of retirement planning, that's your book. And I had a friend recently reach out to me and say, I've heard you talk about this book. Is it good for novices? And I would say, if you're serious about retirement planning, you owe it to yourself to get Wade's book. So um, I want to get into the substance of the conversation, starting with uh, retirement today and thinking about um, pre-retirees or people who expect to retire maybe within the next year or two. How's their timing? Uh, right now. Is this thing on? Yeah. So certainly it has never been a better time to access a variety of low cost, do it yourself investment options. So certainly investors have that going for them. I think about a case that Mike makes with respect to investing. I know you have your own 80-20 single fund that you use in tax advantage accounts. And there's no reason why retirees can't use a similar type of fund where they put all their money in once and it rebalances for them. It's just zero maintenance. It's low cost. It's a very great set and forget investing approach. Maybe 80-20 isn't the right mix for retirees, but Vanguard does have some other mixes in those life strategy funds. And, and even for taxable accounts, iShares, they have their line of tax efficient ETFs, their allocation ETFs, which also could be a good fit too. So Insofar as investing complexity, you don't need it. There's a lot of great solutions out there. And then even retirement planning, there's some great do-it-yourself tools for retirement planning. Uh, we interviewed uh, Stephen Chen recently on the Bogleheads on Investing podcast. We talked about do-it-yourself retirement planning tech. So there are really some phenomenal resources for do-it-yourself retirement planning, financial planning, and investing out right now. Okay, and I should note Steve Chen is here in the uh, audience. Um, maybe not in this room, but he is here at the conference. I think one obvious point that we've been talking about the last couple of days is inflation adjusted interest rates being high makes it a lot easier to feel comfortable spending at any given level from the portfolio than when inflation adjusted interest rates are very low. So in that sense, uh, now is a good time to be a retiree. And I would definitely second that point. The real interest rate is really important. And then just to have a different answer also, there's some good news on the horizon in the Medicare prescription drug world. Uh, in 2024 now, there's no more uh, catastrophic phase where the, uh, if your in drug insurance costs, I'm sorry, <laughs> prescription drug costs are getting too high, there was an unlimited window on how high those could go. The catastrophic phase is gone in 2024, 
And then in 2025, there will be a $2,000 cap on out-of-pocket expenses related to prescription drugs. So if you go with original Medicare plus the Plan G comprehensive supplement, and then now with this out-of-pocket limit on prescription drugs, you can predict pretty well what your potential uh, insurance or your healthcare costs will be in retirement, and that can help manage a significant spending shock of, I don't know what kind of healthcare bills I will face. There is a way now, increasingly, to be able to manage that better. So I wanted to mention Alan Roth is here in the room, and Alan will be taking questions and collating them, and um, he's right there. He just raised his hand. So if you've got a question, write it on a piece of paper and hand it to Alan, and he'll take a look and hand us the best ones. Um, Mike, I wanted to ask, about, ask you about the Social Security adjustment that was just announced, the inflation adjustment. Can you talk about that? It came on a day when the new inflation number was above that 3.2% uh, inflation adjustment. Maybe you can give us a little bit of background on how they come up with that. Uh, 3.2, 3 right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's looking at quarterly CPI figures, basically. So, and it's not, it's essentially inflation over the last year, except it's a, a lag. It's not a calendar year. That's really the gist of it. Um, so, on the one hand, that's a lower adjustment than we've seen in the last couple of years. And so that might feel like it's bad news because you didn't get as much of a raise, but it's because there wasn't as much inflation and that is good news. So, you know, it's good and bad news, however you look at it. And the CPI number can be a little bit different because usually when we talk about inflation, we're talking about the CPIU index. That's the mainstream, what the media is talking about. Social Security actually uses something called CPIW which is urban and clerical workers, and it, it can be a little bit different. That's why <laughs> the announcement of what the overall inflation was over the 12-month lag period can be different from what the social security goal is. Okay, so you just addressed some of the positive tailwinds for new retirees. How about things that you perceive as headwinds? Certainly one thing I think about is uh, elder abuse fraud, uh, you know, there's a whole industry where we, we have these robo scam calls and social security benefits have been uh, suspended or your grandchild has been kidnapped, you know, what have you, they're in our jail in Mexico, you know, send us $10,000, uh, haul it out in a book in the mail. Um, so that's certainly going to be a really uh, big challenge, especially as we get older and we're not quite as sharp as we used to be. Navigating those challenges is going to be uh, quite a lot um, for uh, retirees. And the best solution there is you know, uh, have that resource, uh, you know, set up that uh, financial power of attorney, um, have those trusted parties uh, that are going to help you manage your finances when uh, eventually you may not be able to do so yourself. Seems like that's an argument for simplifying a financial plan too, right, as you age? Okay. Um, you all work with clients to varying degrees. How do you help them when you have a new client who comes in and says, can I retire and when can I retire? What are the key things that you put on the dashboard and what's sort of the exercise that you take them through? I think since we can't know what the future holds in terms of investment returns, inflation and life expectancy and taxes, I think it's always important to have some flexibility baked into a retirement plan. And for some folks, maybe that means working longer or maybe that means possibly working part-time. Uh, but for pretty much everyone, that's going to mean having some flexibility with your spending. And the probably easier way to do this is to put off big expenses during years of poor market performance. So if you have a bad year in the market, maybe it means you'll buy a new car next year. Maybe it means you'll do the home renovation next year. Maybe it means you'll uh, make that big spend uh, in the year that the market um, has it uh, performed poorly. But having some wiggle room in your spending uh, that's going to be critical to any retirement plan, regardless of what metric or technique you use in putting that plan together. In, in terms of trying to assess, do you have enough? Are you ready to retire financially speaking? A lot of the, the approach out there has been like you do a Monte Carlo simulation and look at the probability of success. I've really become more enamored or comfortable with a funded ratio approach, which is basically you assume your investments are gonna earn a, a basic rate of return. You, you can link it to tips. So you use tips as the underlying discount rate in the analysis. 
And then you add up, well, what are all my liabilities? What are the goals I have for retirement? My expenses, if I have a legacy goal, uh, what I want to have set aside as reserves for spending shocks and so forth. And then you start adding up all your assets as well, the different investment accounts, social security as an income stream, other pensions, that sort of thing. And then you calculate the, the present value of all this using the simple interest rate that's not assuming stock market risk. It's just, can, I, can my plan work without taking risk as a starting point? And you look at how much assets do I have compared to liabilities? And if your funded ratio is over 100%, that's a, a pretty good indication that you can start thinking that you're in a pretty comfortable place, that you have what you need to, to successfully retire and to also meet the kinds of spending shocks that you want to be prepared for. Like, it, do I want to plan for a specific long-term care event or that sort of thing? Um, I do like the funded ratio concept a lot, just like Wade. Um, my primary approach is Monte Carlo analysis, um, and that's not honestly because I think that's the best approach and it's better than all of the others it's just what i use i think there's other good approaches also um, if you are using monte carlo analysis the big output number it's going to give you is probability of success just like wade said and that's important but you also want to look at a number of other metrics so in the failure scenarios when did failure occur right did it occur at age 73 or at age 98 and that's a big difference. And so we want to look at other metrics as well as, you know, remaining portfolio value in the median case or the 75th percentile case and 25th percentile case and so on. And so I think I am a big fan of Monte Carlo analysis, but I definitely don't think that um, you need to look at it from a lot of different points of view, not just the probability of success, basically. Well, I wanted to follow up on that probability of success point because it um, is an important dimension of the Monte Carlo analysis. In the simulations that we run in our retirement income research at Morningstar, we use 90% probability is kind of the baseline or the target case. And we sometimes hear pushback, especially from individual investors who say, no, I want 100. I want 100% chance of 100% of odds of not running out of money. Can you all discuss the pros and cons of sort of what is, if you're using Monte Carlo simulations, what is a decent success rate to target? Yeah, um, so on the Longview podcast, Christine interviewed Derek Tharp several months ago. I don't know when exactly, but go look that episode up. It's excellent. Uh, the thing he talks about is if you are going to do a one-time analysis, you're gonna make a single plan and then just not change the plan at all no matter what happens, then yeah, you do want a super, super high probability of success. But if you're willing to update it every single year, maybe adjust our spending a little bit this way, a little bit that way, then a somewhat lower probability of success can be very reasonable. And exactly, you know, I'm using fuzzy words here, right? A high probability of success, a somewhat lower probability of success, and what those words will mean to one person is different than to another person. Because when we talk about risk tolerance, classically, we're talking about, oh, how volatile is my portfolio? And that's a real sort of risk tolerance. But this is the real risk tolerance is how OK am I with needing to change my life because of something that happened in the markets? And so the right answer for one person is simply not going to be the right answer for another person. Yeah, and, and it relates to like not just the, the portfolio itself, because the, the probability of success, the software is not probably not assuming any sort of spending adjustments. So it's really, if you don't change your spending at all, what's the probability that you'll deplete? The reality is, as you get closer to running out of money, you're probably going to adjust spending, and that can help. So it's not like necessarily the catastrophic scenario. Plus, you may have other resources outside of the investment portfolio that speak to, if I have Plenty of my social security is a big one, but other reliable income outside the portfolio. If I have some flexibility for my spending and so forth, there's two ways to be aggressive in retirement. You can invest aggressively and you can spend more aggressively. And if you spend more aggressively, you'll have a lower probability of success, but you, you may be willing to take on a lower probability of success because you can make these adjustments and it's not catastrophic necessarily if you deplete your assets because you do have other spending resources outside of that. So. 90% is often the default, but in a real world case with somebody who's got some flexibility and so forth, 
you might be able to talk about like a 70 or 80% success rate target because you're going to be adjusting it, as Mike said, over time. Yeah, certainly for that 90% success rate, that can be a reasonable way to do it. And I use the word reasonable as a keyword there because none of this is guaranteed. Whether you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation or a funded ratio or anything else, again, to be a little bit of a broken record, you want to have that flexibility baked into your retirement plan because that 90% success rate, that's going to be based upon some guess about future some guess about future inflation, some guess about future investment return, life expectancy, et cetera. And if any of those guesses are wrong, well, now your results are wrong. That's why, again, it's so important to flexibility baked into retirement. So one question I've been thinking a lot about based on my interactions with actual retirees is that people who have been diligent savers throughout their lives oftentimes have a really difficult time transitioning into spending mode and a difficult time giving themselves permission to spend from what they've managed to save. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'd like to hear from the panel about how people should get themselves over that hump. Um, Wade, I noticed you mentioned in the preceding session the, the role of an annuity in this context. I guess a question I have based on that is if someone is having trouble spending from their portfolio, it seems like it could be really difficult for them to part with a substantial share of the portfolio to put into that annuity in the first place. But anyway, maybe you can tackle that question. Yeah, and I'll try to actually answer the question without referring to an annuity. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, there's like the, the pair of like Aesop's fables, you've got ants and grasshoppers, right? The, the ants are preparing for the winter, the grasshoppers out having fun. I think a lot of bogleheads tend to be ants. Mm -hmm. And what the whole retirement world is telling you is you've been an ant your whole life. You're not supposed to flip a switch at retirement and become a, a grasshopper and enjoy yourself. And you're supposed to spend more money. And that can be hard if you're fundamentally frugal. <laughs> you don't necessarily get satisfaction out of just spending more money just because you can. So part of it is just recognizing what your lifestyle is. And if you're, you're comfortable spending what you're spending, just because you could spend more doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend more. Uh, but the other angle of that too, I think one of the, the big drivers of this idea that people are worried about spending money relates to this healthcare concern or long-term care concern. It's like, I, I'm worried I can't spend my money because I'm worried I may need it for a big nursing home stay in the future. And I, I think the way to help with that consideration is, I like to talk about assets as reliable income, diversified portfolio, and reserve assets. And reserve, ear, uh, reserve assets are what you have that's not been earmarked to something else. And so if you can kind of work through this and say, well, I, I do have a home or I do have some surplus assets over here. I, I do have something that I can call reserves that if I do have a significant long-term care shock, I'll be able to use that to help fund the long-term care need. If you can actually picture that in your mind, that may be a way to make it easier to then go ahead and, and spend some of those assets because you're not like overwhelmed by, I've got this one pot of assets that I need to use for everything and I'm worried about spending it. You can say, I, there's some reserve assets on the side that can help manage that type of spending shock. Sounds like a bucket. Um, I want to <laughs> stick with the long-term care question because I had it last in my queue, but since Wade brought it up, I would like to hear from the panel about how they think people should address the long-term care risk. So Wade just referenced the idea of having a separate silo of assets that you could use. I'm guessing that probably a lot of folks in this room have gone that route, the self-funding route, but I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on insurance products, um, specifically the hybrid type products, and one of the most compelling arguments I've heard in favor of them is um, Carolyn McClanahan made the point to me that families that she's known who have had hybrid long-term care life policies have been more able to use the benefit than they would feel to spend on long-term care that um, they would have been reluctant to invade their portfolio to get the care that they needed, which I thought sounded like a pretty compelling argument. Yeah, so certainly uh, you want to look at your total assets and figure out, is it reasonable for you to self-fund or not? And, and the folks that I work with, sometimes they've got way more money they can possibly ever spend, especially if they're the ants who you know, have trouble moving to that grasshopper stage of life. And so for them, self-funding can be reasonable. 
Um, but one consider consideration there that I, I do want to add is that uh, if you are going to self-fund uh, for the possibility of long-term care, you want to think about investing appropriately appropriately. That's to say, hey, you might need long-term care tomorrow, um, so perhaps investing very aggressively with your portfolio um, isn't going to help you best um, sell fund. Uh, alternatively, for those folks who don't have enough assets, long-term care insurance, as tough of a bullet as it uh, might be to bite, it can help manage risk. I've got a bias towards managing risk, so using the right insurance product uh, can help. Now, uh, generally, I like a pure insurance product as opposed to a, a hybrid uh, product because it's going to be a better deal. Uh, but if there's some, you know, human behavioral issues in there and it's, you know, don't buy that pure long-term care insurance uh, or nothing at all or, you know, buy that hybrid product, then I, I guess I'll uh, prefer the client buy the hy hybrid product in that situation. So insurance works best when it's, a, a low probability but high cost scenario we're trying to insure against. Long-term care is a high cost scenario, but it's not a low probability event. <laughs> uh, that's the, the issue. It's very hard for traditional long-term care insurance to be affordable at a reasonable premium just because the odds of somebody actually using the benefits are, are relatively high, at least compared to other types of insurance out there. So there are the, the different hybrid options that combine either a life insurance or annuity with long-term care. Uh, they, they can work, like I'm not a, a big fan of them or necessarily, I, I don't think they're a bad idea, but it, to the point you made, Christine, there can be value in at least having some sort of small policy in place, both for the reason you mentioned where a lot of times someone might be thinking of self-fund, but then when the time comes, they feel worried about spending their children's legacy or inheritance, and so they don't get the care that they need. And, and nobody's worried about spending the insurance company's money. So if you have the policy, at least it helps get you moved towards getting the care that you need. The other thing is also a lot of policies have a care coordination benefit where there will be a professional who will help you find the services you need, which may be otherwise very difficult because when you need long-term care, you're probably going to have a hard time figuring that out, what you need specifically. And it's a big burden for other family members as well. So having a care coordination benefit as part of a policy can help get you to the right, right institution, help get you the care you need, and help get you going down the road in a correct direction in a manner that's not burdening your family to, to such an extent. So um, going back to the self-funding folks, in terms of um, how to invest, John, you referenced that, but I'd like to talk about um, how big that fund should be. So say you're a married couple, um, how much you should set aside or a single person, and then also where to silo those long-term care assets. What are, what's the best account type if I'm thinking of earmarking a portion of my portfolio for long-term care expenses that I'll pay out of pocket? Um, as far as amount, that's going to depend significantly on where you live because the cost of long-term care is dramatically different from New York City to a more rural location. Um, so that would, that's what I would do. I would simply research what is the cost of where I live and looking at studies, because there are studies, but also looking at specific facilities literally in where you live, not just at the state level, but in your local area. And this is a facility that I could see myself living in. How much does it cost? Like that's the shopping we want to do, not just looking at uh, you know, a paper that somebody put out. Um, as far as the account, that's a tricky one because we don't know when it's going to happen. Um, so frankly, I don't, at least what I'm discussing this with clients, I don't treat it any differently than any other spending in that regard because the only way that we could make a very good decision is if we could predict exactly when you will need it and we can't. So I, I, I don't separate out a, a separate portion and say, this amount in this account is the long-term care bucket. I, I don't do that. Yeah, to e echo uh, Mike's point, in, insofar as you know, this account is for this uh, goal, et cetera, I don't necessarily do that because you can just buy uh, whatever investment you've sold back uh, from another account. So you don't necessarily have to do that uh, compartmentalization. Um, insofar as the cost, you want to be looking at you know, setting aside uh, whatever amount 
to something that you might get for an equivalent benefit of purchasing a long-term care insurance policy. So if you're looking at maybe a $300,000 long-term care insurance policy benefit that you would purchase, that wouldn't be an unreasonable amount um, to set aside. And then touching a little bit more about that investing component, because you might need as much as $100,000 uh, in that first year if you're uh, in a moderately, um, uh, insofar as the facilities of a long-term care facility, uh, your portfolio should be not very aggressively invested because if you have to take $100,000 distribution, it's probably not a tiny part of your portfolio and you don't want to be do doing that uh, during some poor market uh, returns. So investing uh, appropriately, uh, relatively conservatively, if you're going to self-fund for at least that portion of your portfolio, it helps better ensure the money is going to be there uh, when you need it. Can we go back to the ants and grasshoppers for just one second? Sure. Thank you. So this is something that people ask all the time is, you know, I'm not comfortable spending for my portfolio. And relatedly, a question that I get a lot is just the can I retire question. And a lot of times, as soon as I dig into the math, you could have retired seven years ago. And, and when that's the situation, and that's, I mean, that is the boglehead prototype, honestly. Like, when that's the case, if you're still feeling anxiety about it, having somebody else tell you that yes, you could retire could help, but there's also a very real chance that what's going on here is not about your portfolio, right? It's about something inside you. And so, I mean, I mentioned this in my most recent book and I didn't know how people would receive it, but it's gone over well, so I'll say it here too. And that is mental health care is a good thing, right? I mean, I've, I've been through counseling, most of my loved ones have too. It's very valuable. And if you're feeling intense anxiety and there's simply nothing in your finances that should be causing you anxiety because you've really got these things taken care of from a purely financial point of view, looking into mental health care is a good idea. And if people are scared about it, and I will tell you it is a low risk proposition because you're gonna spend about one hour the person is being paid to be nice to you, and that's it. It doesn't cost that much for one session. So if that's a thing, a situation you're in, the solution frequently is not a financial solution. It's something else. That's good advice, Mike. Thank you. I wanted to, um, Mike, go back to your book, More Than Enough, because you and I had a conversation about that, and we talked about this idea of sort of consumption, people hear that they should be spending more, and it doesn't have to be on themselves. And you made the point that it can make a bigger impact on kids for them to inherit some money from you when they're younger, when they're launching, when they're buying their first home or trying to decide whether to go back to grad school. Can you expand on that? Yeah, this another thing we see in Bogleheads, you see it on the forum all the time, is people who have done a great job saving and investing through their careers, and then at age 65, they inherit a big lump sum from their parents. And at that point, it doesn't do anything for them. And if we think about it, that's honestly just kind of how the math works. The age most people are when they have kids, the age to which most people live. Your kids, kids, they're not kids anymore at that point. They're most likely to be inheriting this money at a point where they're already financially independent. And so, Doing, you know, doing this giving a much smaller amount can be very much more impactful at an earlier age. You know, whether that's, um, it could be the home down payment money for their first house. It could be the helping to pay off student loans. And so if your kids are already past those points, now we're talking about grandkids, but those things, even if they're smaller amounts, can be just enormously impactful in a way that even a mid-seven-figure inheritance isn't. I want to switch back to portfolio structure, um, and we touched heavily on investing in the first half of today, but I'd like to go back to bonds, because I think many of us have heard that we should have bonds in our retirement, pre-retirement portfolios, and yet bonds have um, just 
behaved terribly over the past year and a half. They've been very disappointing um, in the face of rising interest rates, doing exactly what we would expect them to do, but nonetheless unwelcome. So can you talk about um, how investors should think about bonds, especially relative to cash, with cash yields looking so attractive, it's very hard to get excited about parking a portion of my portfolio in something that could have losses when I can lock in almost 5% without any risk of at least uh, near-term loss. So, uh, Rick Ferry talked about this earlier in a little uh, group, so I'll, I'll paraphrase him because he said the point well, is that adding bonds to your portfolio don't mean nothing bad is gonna happen, it just decreases the risk that something bad does happen. So much of investing, nothing is guaranteed. Uh, if we look at you know, the S&P 500, for example, from March of 2000 to uh, March of 2009, it offered a negative uh, return. Uh, so now we're certainly not throwing out the S&P 500 um, from our portfolio, but it, investing takes time. Um, all asset classes, all different types of investments um, have their day in the sun. Um, as Jack Bogle would say, we just need to stay the course. Um, one thing I'll just add is that if you're looking at cash, you're not locking in that rate. That's how cash works, right? The interest rate changes. Whereas, so the reason you might be inclined to stick with intermediate term bonds or something other than cash is because you would be locking in that rate for a longer period of time. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea, but that is the, the trade-off that you're making. Yeah, so relatedly, it seems like a lot of financial advisors I talk to have found religion about not taking risk with, with fixed income, that they're all governments, they're all short term. Is that a reasonable way to think about it? It seems like the assertion that I hear is that this is not a portion of the portfolio you want to take risks with. What's the case for venturing out on the maturity spectrum, at least? So I'm the one who doesn't really like like traditional bonds for the retirement income portfolio. It's, so it's, you've got tips and one case for a longer term tips wouldn't be just a, a, bond, a tips fund with a long duration. But if you're laddering bonds, if you want 10 years of expenses, inflation adjusted, you could build yourself a 10 year tips ladder. If you want 30 years, you could build yourself a 30 year tips ladder. That would be a reason when you look at what's the duration on my 30 year tips ladder, it's gonna be high, but you're, as an individual household investor, you're not exposed to that interest rate risk if you really are truly planning to hold those bonds to maturity and spend those proceeds when they mature. That, that can be the justification for going towards a, a longer duration. But even with all the, the retirement income research out there, Bill Bingen looked at the different, you use treasury bills, do you use intermediate term bonds, do you use long term bonds. Long term bonds are just too volatile relative to any additional yield they may provide. Uh, treasury or um, T bills were a little bit, <laughs> they're less volatile, but not enough yield. It, he found that the sweet spot was the intermediate term government bonds, and that's about a five year maturity. So that's really what the research is pointing to. Now, right now, if you want to go less than five years, I do think maybe you're venturing into market timing a little bit with that, moving away from whatever the standard approach is. But, but yeah, and then otherwise, again, just. If you're using bond ladders, that would be the way to start thinking about going to a longer duration with your bonds. So I've been hearing a lot about bond ladders during this conference, and a question I have is sort of, the, and they touched on it in the previous session, but the um, bond versus bond fund, and um, can part of that be addressed by just buying the right maturity bond fund? Can part of the risks associated with owning a bond fund relate to just having the right time horizon in mind for that bond fund? So it's mathematically possible that you can duration match your bond fund to the liability you're trying to fund, but your retirement spending goal liability, uh, that's gonna have a fluctuating duration. And so in practice, it becomes very difficult to duration match your bond fund to the liability that you're trying to fund. There are a few commercial uh, companies that have provided a solution but even then, they have to assume things like, well, is it a 25-year retirement or what the case will be? So yes, in theory, you could try to use a bond fund to duration match the liability in your retirement that you're trying to fund. In practice, um, it, it's a very heavy-duty <laughs> math problem to try to solve. And very few companies even offer solutions trying to do that. 
So certainly doing a, a treasury ladder or a tips ladder isn't unreasonable, yet to be a little bit of a broken record, I always just encourage folks to think about the complexity of the investment plan they're, that they're gonna put in place. Yes, you, you could do that, but I want you to consider if you're making a 30 year ladder and maybe you're in your 60s now, that means you're managing this thing into your 90s. Is that something um, that you wanna be doing? And then you also should have some considerations about your legacy investment plan. Maybe you love a bond ladder, but maybe your spouse doesn't. So yes, it is one way to do it and it's certainly reasonable, but I always wanna encourage folks to uh, keep it simple. Again, there's some really great zero maintenance funds out there um, that have bonds of various maturities that, and when you look at the total bonds that are in a bond ladder, um, aren't gonna be too dissimilar um, from what you're gonna get in a fund. Um, we will be taking questions. Alan Roth is collecting your cards, so raise your hand if you have a question that you would like to turn over to Alan. I wanted to ask about taxes, and I think we could do this whole session on tax planning during and leading up to retirement. But I'd like to ask about um, people who are in the home stretch maybe five years before retirement. They're trying to decide what account types to prioritize if they're saving, which ones they should fund. Um, Mike, maybe you can talk about how to triangulate that question, whether to make traditional tax-deferred contributions or Roth contributions at that life stage. Sure. The answer there is actually the exact same answer it's been your whole career that you've had access to Roth and tax deferred anyway, which is it depends on the tax rate that you expect to be paying whenever these dollars come out of the account later as compared to the tax rate that would apply now, like what rate of tax savings would you get on tax deferred contributions? Um, so it's the exact same question. The only thing is that the circumstances, the inputs are different because A, your income in the years at least for a lot of people, in the years immediately preceding retirement is often the highest it's been, not necessarily for some people, it's, you know, you're scaling back, but the higher your rate of income, the more appealing tax deferred contributions become. But on the other hand, the closer you get towards retirement, the better we can see what do the account balances look like? And I know that for a lot of people, especially in the boomer generation where you had access to tax deferred for a good number of years before you had access to Roth at all. And when you did first get access to Roth, it was Roth IRAs with a tiny contribution limit. And so for so many people in this room, you've got big tax deferred balances and much less big Roth balances. And so that kind of starting to, to tell you the story of what the retirement tax rates going to look like. It's, it's going to be higher than you might've guessed 20 years ago when you first started, you know, or however many years ago when you first decided to start contributing to tax deferred accounts. And so once we start to get that sense that, boy, there's a lot of tax deferred balances here and the tax rate in retirement is likely to be higher, then suddenly we're looking at Roth. Yeah, so I, I did the, the presentation on this yesterday. It was like a fire hose, but I don't know if I ever really articulated like what you are actually <laughs> doing so the, the kind of, for me, the tax efficient drawdown strategy with this is, while you still have taxable funds, you cover your spending needs through the taxable account, and then you're looking to see if on top of that you can do Roth conversions and, and pay taxes from the taxable account on those Roth conversions. And that's what's happening until the taxable account depletes. Then you switch over to, you now need to cover your spending needs through the, the IRA, the tax deferred account, and you're managing the tax threshold of, well, maybe you can meet all your spending needs and still do a Roth conversion. It's gonna be a lot harder at that point because you gotta cover your spending needs through the IRA first, and that's generating a lot of taxable income. But if, if otherwise, if the tax bracket you're managing is lower, you may, you're gonna blend between the tax deferred account and the Roth to cover your spending needs. So your, part of your spending comes from the IRA, the rest will come from the Roth. And then when we're talking about, well, what's the efficient tax rate to manage? The answer is partly driven by the tax rate that's efficient to manage is what's going to be allow allowing you to smooth distributions from the tax deferred and Roth accounts throughout your entire retirement so that you maintain that capacity to manage the uh, particular level of income that you, you wanted to manage for that. Just add one tiny point because everything there is exactly how I would put it. I will just add that it's, you're 
trying ideally not just to smooth the tax rate through your retirement, but also retirement and the 10 years after you pass away. Because that's frankly when a lot of the money is going to be coming out of the account, most likely. And then, of course, we're looking at somebody else's tax rate or some plural, somebody else's tax rate. And uh, we started to talk a little bit about giving. And one important question there is um, charitable giving to the extent that you're planning on leaving assets to a nonprofit, then that future tax rate is zero, and that has a huge impact on all of these tax planning, retire, retirement tax planning decisions that we make. If a chunk of the money is gonna be coming out later at a 0% rate, that affects all of this math. Great point, and I would just note the Bogle Center is indeed a not-for-profit of 501c3. <laughs> um, now we're on to the good questions. Should you pay off your home before retirement? And just really quick, that's boglecenter.org slash donate. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so going back to, we touched on, hey, if I'm gonna have long-term care expenses and there's gonna be a big distribution, again, 100 grand, maybe in that first year need long-term care because uh, that stuff, um, those facilities are expensive. Uh, you wanna be invest investing not very aggressively uh, because you're gonna need that money to come out, ideally, uh, not during a market correction. If there is a market correction, you want your portfolio less impacted and investing more conservatively uh, helps uh, ensure that. So it's gonna be the same thing with a decision to pay off that mortgage because if you don't pay off the mortgage and now there's a market correction, that means that's a bigger amount that has to come out of the portfolio during a market drawdown. It's that mortgage payment. So by not having that mortgage payment, now you don't have to take out as much of your portfolio during a, a market drawdown. So uh, paying off your mortgage is a risk management strategy uh, in retirement. That's what folks want to be uh, thinking about with respect to, hey, should I pay this thing off or it's not? So how do rising yields figure into this? Because many people now have mortgage interest rates that are well below what they could get on very safe securities. Yeah, so if you're looking at, at your total portfolio, the total portfolio uh, performance, again, you know, let's uh, think about that one single balance fund I'm going to keep my investments simple. Uh, your portfolio is still going to be down regardless um, of what you're getting uh, on the bonds. So to manage risk, to avoid having to spend more from your portfolio when the market is down, you don't want to have that mortgage payment. Um, if your mortgage rate is 3% and cash or bonds are yielding 5-ish, it's not super appealing to eliminate 5% yielding investments to pay down 3% interest rate. On the other hand, for anybody who has a new mortgage, and so it's a 7 point whatever percent interest rate, that's, you know, the math is exactly the opposite. Yeah, okay. Um, Mike, can you talk about your uh, funded ratio Excel? Sure. Um, so this is uh, just an article I wrote a while ago that just explained the funded ratio concept, which is what Wade was talking about, and frankly, Wade is a much deeper expert in this concept than I am. Um, in the article, I just made a very, very quick spreadsheet to illustrate the way that the, the math works, just so you can see how it works in Excel if you're an Excel sort of person. Um, Wade has built an actual application, which includes tax calculations and on and on. And so the spreadsheet is basically an illustration of well, how funded ratio math works. That's, that's what I would say. Um, but I think really, if we want to hear more about funded ratio, Wade's definitely the person. Well, at, at Retirement Researcher, we do quarterly retirement income challenges. A lot of vocal heads have joined them. They're free, and it's a week-long thing, and you have access to our funded ratio tool during the week, and you're free to use it for the week and run your plan and, and all that sort of thing, and it's no obligation involved just kind of leave it there as a plug. Okay, um, here's another household capital allocation question. My husband retired three years ago and I have three or four years before I retire. Does it make sense for me to keep contributing to my 401k while my husband is taking from his IRA? I can't get a grasp on what to do, we are debt free. Sorry, could you repeat the scenario? So, was, yes, <laughs> she is contributing to her 401k, still working. Husband is retired and pulling from his IRA to maybe, you know, meet additional living expenses that they need above and beyond her income. And is it wise for them to continue down this path? Knowing that 
we can't provide anyone with specific advice knowing that we don't know their whole situation. But Sure. So in that case, basically all we're doing is we're swapping IRA dollars for 401k dollars. They're both tax deferred. In that sense, it's a wash. And 401k dollars can become IRA dollars later. Um, so I guess a couple of concepts there that might apply is that 401ks have better asset protection in terms of if you get sued, that might be relevant, might not be relevant to your household. Um, another point that is relevant, I guess, also, as I just think about this, is that we're not only swapping um, IRA for 401 401k, but we're swapping his for hers. And so if they're different ages, then that could be relevant also, potentially, but it's probably, probably really not that big of a decision, frankly. Uh, it's not changing that much to go from, from one account to the other, especially once you're already retired and you've got the ability to, to move the money between them. Oh, yes, then that for sure, right, that's a great point. If there is a match in the 401k, we still definitely want to be getting at least that match. Yeah, excellent. And related to what Mike said too, if she's younger, that would be a way to help defer RMDs into the future as well. Yeah, good point. Uh, you know, Related to this, Jamie Hopkins, who's a retirement guy, made a point to me that um, for some people, the greater good is actually to stop contributing to their retirement plans if it can help them continue to work longer. If, the, if they can spend what they would otherwise save and that makes them, just gives them a better quality of life. John, you're nodding. Have you run into this with clients or... Um, I mean, the, the math is certainly there because if it, the option A is, A, I retire and now I'm pulling a hundred grand out from my portfolio or uh, option B is I'm just not going to put, you know, 10 grand in more uh, next year, uh, then certainly not taking a hundred grand out, that's going to increase the odds of your retirement plan. So if someone's looking at that decision and the retirement plan, you know, needs some work, they're not, you know, really fully funded, that could be a very reasonable way to go. <laughs> Yeah, just the best way to get a retirement plan on track is to work longer. Just for the, what you're doing with that is it's another year of work, so more time for your savings to grow, uh, a shorter than subsequent retirement horizon. You may be increasing your Social Security benefit as well by working longer. So at, at the end of the day, if doing this idea of taking it, don't contribute to your savings, but instead take a vacation, and then that allows you to work longer, yes, financially that would be better than worrying that you didn't make the full contribution to your retirement plan. Yeah. Um, question related to long-term care. My long-term care insurance premium is going up for the fourth time. Is there a product available where the costs are more predictable? Anyone have any specific knowledge of, I assume this is like a pure long-term care insurance policy. Yeah, that, that's where the, the hybrid products usually have guaranteed premiums, and part of the whole effort to create those in the first place was this issue that with traditional long-term care, premiums can be increased over time, and that's what's tended to happen. So that is one of the selling points of the hybrid products, is that you are guaranteed not to have premium increases in the future. I don't know the scenario at this point about switching to something else. You really have to do the analysis at that point, but... Uh, that's an option. Do any of you have experience with um, switching from a pure life insurance product to a hybrid product, doing one, you know, 1035 exchange from one to the other? No. Not, not personal experience, but that is another point. Like when I, I mentioned in the previous session, I got a whole life policy and I didn't realize it when I was purchasing it, but it has an acceleration of death benefit rider that if I have a long term care need, I can, it's not a hybrid policy, but I can accelerate to receive the death benefit to pay for long-term care needs. So that, that, you may have something like that already. You might want to check your life insurance. But if, if not, you can do the, the 1035 exchange where you switch from one life insurance policy to another, including these hybrid policies, without creating a taxable event. Okay. So I assume this is from someone who is already retired. The question is, for each year, would it be better to withdraw once a year, semi-annually, quarterly, or monthly? Any thoughts on sort of the cadence of distributions? So again, I've got that bias for simplicity. Make it easy on yourself. Uh, do it once a year, and then you know, go live your life. Don't you know, look at your portfolio uh, every month. 
Yeah, mathematically, obviously, in theory, the longer you leave your assets invested, the greater the return will be. But if we're talking about leaving them invested for a few more months for a relatively small amount, because it's just a few months of spending, it's not a big difference. Yeah, a lot of the research just assumes you take out once a year at the start of the year because it's using annual data. But the reality is you might smooth that over time. And also just if you're spending the qualified dividends and interest payments and so forth, that may be an automatic way over time of replenishing your checking account by having those payments go there rather than necessarily reinvesting them when you're in the retirement phase. Okay, here's a question to end on. Best DIY tools for pre-retirement and retirement income planning. Wade's book is great, but I don't wanna build ground up spreadsheets, spreadsheets from the ground up. So um, quick, maybe lightning round here. What are your favorite go-to uh, tools that are maybe free or uh, you know, very nominal charge, or even maybe some that charge a little bit more that you think are worthwhile? Yeah, so a bit of a broken record. So I care less about the exact tool that you use, but understand that this is just one calculator making a whole bunch of silly guesses about the future that probably aren't gonna all come out. So regardless of what tool you have, Again, understand that if all go, doesn't go according to plan, you might have to change it. So expect to make changes to your plan. That's gonna be way more important than whatever tool that you use. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have a very satisfactory answer here because the software that I personally use is priced for advisors and it really wouldn't make sense for somebody to pay that full price themselves just to use it one time. Um, new retirement is the one I hear about the most without a doubt, and I don't know if Steve's in the room, but he is, he's in the Bogleheads community, he's active here, he cares about your input. Um, I can't say that I've test driven it thoroughly myself, so I, I can't say very much, but I hear generally good things. Um, other software that I hear good things about, uh, Maxify Planner uh, by Lawrence Kotlikoff is something I hear universally good things about, and he's a, a deep subject matter expert on a range of retirement topics. Yeah, I will say really quickly that new retirement is quite similar to the uh, very expensive advisor software uh, that's out there. Uh, but again, just have flexibility in your plan. And on the software, I've been meaning to do a deeper dive into that. I haven't yet, but what I have heard from a lot of individuals, so in addition to new retirement and Maxify, to have the full list of things I've heard good things about, Pralana Gold is another software package, and then Flexible Retirement Planner. I think all four of those get pretty detailed in the calculations. Okay, um, I want to note that we will have a 10 minute break, then we will reconvene in this room for a conversation with Dana Ansbach. I want you to join me in thanking Mike and John and Wade here today. Thank you.